Welcome. We're just getting going now in a minute or two. So with your patience, we might just wait one or two more minutes to let people into the room. So it's great to have so many of you here with us this morning. And I'm hoping that the sun is shining where you are. Okay. Vic Gray and Luke and Joe. <laughs> it, it, it's a bit gray in uh, Temple Oak as well, but the yeah, sun is it's shining. Very gray and Luke, and, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> well, a nice hot cup of tea and an hour and Absolutely, a half of chat. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, actually, okay. I've just boiled the kettle. I'll make I'll make a coffee now. <laughs> while we that's, a, that's a really good idea. Yeah, so hopefully the, the chat and the discussions now for the next hour and a half will warm us up and a bit of brightness in the day on this grey Wednesday. Okay, so there's just some information in the chat there for everybody um, around the recording of this session. Uh, we're recording the session really to share it with others who maybe couldn't make the session around the, the writing and submissions for the Adult Learner Journal this year. So um, if you could just read that in the chat and make sure you're okay with that. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so there's more people coming along now and we'll get going in just a minute. Um, just to say, my name is Jane O'Kelly, um, and I'm on the editorial board of the Adult Learner Journal with a, a number of colleagues that are with us here today. Um, the editorial board is comprised of members from, well, people who are primarily very committed and interested in adult and community education and share uh, our ethos and values in this area and have experience and expertise in adult and community education and the broader aspects of education and training as well. And the editorial board um, is composed of members from the AEO A Association. I probably put too many acronym letters in there, the Adult Education Organizers Association, um, higher education institutions across Ireland, uh, North and South, and also international members, uh, academics from the University of Porto and um, Brussels as well, University in the Flemish part of Brussels. So we're very happy that um, our editorial reach has expanded to include our colleagues from across Europe um, and also to have all of our colleagues across adult and community education and higher education as part of that board. So two members of our board are here today, Rosemary Moreland, from the, uh, who's actually the editor of the Adult Learner Journal from University of Ulster, and also David Mallows, um, who's with us from the University College of London. And we have a long association and experience in adult and community education. So we're delighted they're here today to join us in our discussions. And um, we also have Denise Shannon, who is a friend uh, and colleague of the journal and across adult education from her work in Lurgis and European programs for many years, and now who works in literacy uh, in the CDETB and is an experienced author and researcher and has published in the Adult Learner. So she's going to give us some time today to talk about her experience of that and will join us in the discussion group as well. Of course, we have our AINTAS colleagues with us, Juliana and Eve and Karis and, and others who will be supporting us in the discussion groups, uh, answering any questions that you have, and um, also will be there for you through the whole process of applying to the Adult Learner Journal. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. So as people are joining us now, just to keep on record for the day, because we appreciate that time um, is tight <laughs> at this time of year, at the end of November. We have an agenda where we're going to have um, some just some input here now from Denise Shannon, who's going to talk to us about her experience of publishing in the journal and applying. 
And then we're going to have a presentation from myself, which is to give you the kind of nuts and bolts um, of the history of the Adult Learner Journal, of the submissions that we generally have, and also the process then of applying. And um, my little joke here is that surgeons cut and lectures talk and talk. So I'm going to rely on my colleagues here to let me know um, when to stop. And then we will move into discussion groups where you'll have an opportunity to work with uh, uh, other interested authors, potential authors, and also with the editorial board. So I think at this stage, we'll get going. And the very first thing I want to do is to get to know a little bit about you. So we're going to try be in the 21st century and use Menti. And some of you may be very familiar with this, so we'll give it a go. You'll need your phones or just to maybe minimize the screen and use your laptop to answer just three short questions to give us an idea of who's with us today. So I hope that you maybe have used Menti before, but really, it's just about going to menti.com and putting that code in on your phone or on your laptop or your tablet and answering these questions as we go. So could everybody um, have a little go on that on the Menti right now? So I'm going to do it too. And we'll see how this works. Excellent, a dot. A few more dots, that's great. Moving oh, up north. Right by Loch Ney, excellent. They're big dots. <laughs> so we Jane, might be- Jane, I'm, on, I'm off the right. I'm in the white bit there. That oh, doesn't thank you. In the map. Thank you, David. Sorry about that. There's a few of us over there as well. <laughs> There's there, least... it's on the right. Three of you coming in from outside of Ireland. Um, I should have put the EU map there, but just for the, the scale. <laughs> I could add where I'd like to be. Oh, well, that's a good idea. <laughs> um, but welcome. Yeah. Welcome, Thank everyone you. coming in. Um, it's wonderful to have you here. And, and we have people uh, over in the West as well. Great to see you. Welcome. Oh, right down the end of the peninsula there in the very, very south of Ireland. Beautiful part of the world. Um, and also right along the East Coast there. Oh, great, someone from the Midlands or further down the Midlands. You notice I'm not calling out counties because that's my expertise <laughs> isn't in geography. <laughs> so we live in hope. Um, that's wonderful, everyone. Thanks for taking the time on that. I'm, I'm going to move on to the next question and your screen should change or else um, ask you to change. Of course, that's not what it's doing. So I'm just going to stop and open that up again and make sure that that's there for you. Okay. Best laid plans of mice and men. Here we go. Next question. <laughs> Everyone seeing that okay? Just a broad topic or your area of interest that you're thinking you might write to for this particular journal this year. Brilliant. That's wonderful. Sustainability, very, very topical as always and um, transformational learning wonderful to see community education trauma sensitive education very very interesting very valuable and important and, and not talked about enough um, neurodiversity again something very close to my heart would love to see more discussion about it in further education and training ageism um, I have many colleagues working in intergenerational learning and looking at um, older learners and the fact also that after 65 you're not even documented and um, to a certain extent in measurements or metrics and um, so it's interesting to see that come through hong kongers well that's intriguing <laughs> that sounds very interesting and again with what's going on um across the world very very relevant and topical migrants 
very, very interesting work going on there and important work that needs to be recorded, documented, um, represented, presented. And growth mindset and problem-based learning, uh, experiential learning, social, emotional learning. Wonderful. That's wonderful stuff there. Thank you very much, guys. I really appreciate that. And this is the last one, just in terms of the discussion groups to give us an idea as well where you are um, in terms of publishing our writing. Many of us write, but we don't submit it for publication. So that's part of that experience as well. All right. OK. Great. Brilliant. Thank you. OK, so we have a number of people who have published articles in journals. That's wonderful. And people who haven't experienced that yet, but do also write written reports and evaluations. That's something that increasingly we do as part of our work um, and in other areas as well. That's wonderful. Thanks, everyone. Great. OK, well, that's great to have a snapshot uh, of where people are. I really appreciate that. I'm just going to close the mentee down um, and I want to introduce my colleague uh, and, and uh, friend, Denise Shannon, to speak to you for a few moments about her experience as a published author in the Adult Learner Journal. Thanks, Jane. Uh, it's really nice to be asked to come and talk about um, my experience of writing in the journal. It's a little while ago now. Um, and I can see there, there's quite a lot of experienced people in the room um, as well. So maybe some of my suggestions here <laughs> may, may be familiar to you. But I know for me, it was an opportunity after completing my master's where I had quite a large piece of work done um, and a possibility to actually refine it. And I saw it as kind of a second chance to actually really get the story of my research out in a really succinct way into an audience that was receptive, hopefully, to what I was, what I was saying in the article. So for me, from the outset, um, I suppose the first thing was writing the abstract. And I found the abstract just being really key to actually getting out for myself what I wanted to uh, set out in the article. Um, and writing a good abstract is really useful because you can, for yourself um, in writing it, but also in terms of what the reader can expect, um, your approach to the article, the main themes you're going to address, um, what you may, what conclusions you're going to make, um, and it's it's quite a short piece. I think it's maybe one or two hundred words. So do have a look at how other people have done it in in the journal. Um, I found that a really good uh, kind of starting point. Um, in terms of the introduction, then you have you know this kind of your scene setting, uh, the premise of your article, the key themes you're going to address. So for me, I think I picked about four or five kind of key areas I was going to look at. Um, in my article, some people do more and less. So just have a look at, at how people kind of construct or, or what they set out in their article to do. Because I know, I think it's about 8,000 words. Is it the limit for a theory-based article, which is what I was doing? And I suppose for me, when you're trying to introduce concepts, so concepts like radical adult education, discourse analysis, anything that's kind of a little bit different or something that um, the reader is going to need to know about um, to understand the article and, and be comfortable reading it. So Jane used to say to me, state the bleeding obvious. So and do. So you have to when you're when you're going through the article to to kind of take the reader by the hand and have them be able to follow um, what you're what you're what you're talking about. And you don't have to do it in a labored way, just in enough enough for them to be able to, to understand um, I found using headings really useful. Um, I mean, when you, if you're into writing and you like reading, headings can be annoying um, to some people, but they're extremely useful for writing um, and they're extremely useful in a journal article because you're you're kind of, uh, putting a structure on the article, a uh, structure for yourself and a structure for the reader. And it can really help you um, just to keep that story succinct. Um, for me, uh, I got others to read the article. God help them and give me feedback. Those people that didn't know very much about what I was talking about. And if they could understand it, then I was on, on a winner. Um, you will get feedback from the editorial board. Use it. Um, also look at how others have written on your topic in the journal. If it's an Irish, um, you know, you may not you may be a brand new topic. So you're 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 breaking ground. But do have a look and see how others may have 
written around the topic that you're that you're working on. Um, I cannot stress enough how much I read my article over and over and over and over and edit, edit, edit and rewriting, rewriting. It is the only way you're going to make your article coherent and readable and succinct, succinct. Like it is the polishing is everything. So that's for me, once I had the article kind of put together and kind of the story in my head um, or the story and the writing of it, it was the, the editing and the editing and the reading that really, really brought it together and made it um, the polished thing that it became in the end. <laughs> so that's my that's my little bit of um, feedback or tip, I suppose, tip, few tips, but I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with this already, but um, hopefully we'll get to explore a little more in the workshops. Thanks so much, Denise. Uh, there's really key tips uh, and ideas from your experience there that are so relevant, um, especially kind of that organising it in your head through the abstract and then the headings. Um, even if you remove the headings afterwards, the headings while you're writing are, are, are so yeah. key. Yeah. Um, and, and I think the proofing and the editing afterwards to allow time for that is, is so important. Does anyone have a question for Denise that you can either unmute your mic or we can have it in the chat if you prefer. Denise will be joining us in a discussion group at the end, so uh, you will have a chance to speak with her. There it as would well. be lovely. It would be lovely to get a link to your article, Denise, so that we can um, have a chance. Yeah, have a sure, no well. problem. Yeah, great. thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Yep, yeah, sure we make that happen. Indeed, um, the adult learner journals are also up on the AINTIS website in a PDF format for everyone to reach. And that's part of what the journal is trying to do is to extend the reach to everybody, not just people who are working in academia or have access to, to published work through the big publishers. So um, all of those articles are there, but I think we could uh, identify Denise's in particular and send it on. 2019, 2019. 29, that was the year. <laughs> Before COVID, yeah. And and Denise, were you an experienced journal article writer at the time? No, no, it was my first time. Yeah, yeah. So, but I had, I suppose, the foundation of the master's in my head. So it was very soon after completing the master's that I wrote the article for the journal. So it was all, all there, you know, it was all in the brain. <laughs> Brilliant. at that point yeah yeah so, so it's just getting it down on the on the page yes, onto the page and reducing the word count so yeah I suppose I started with the material I had the I had the the corpus I had the big thing that I had to kind of shape um so I was lucky that way I wasn't starting from complete um blank page you know but I don't think anyone here probably is they probably have a, a fairly you know a good plan in their heads at this point it's a, yeah in the workshop I Absolutely. And we can discuss that and see how we can support people. If you have an idea or you've been part of a project or a program or you've witnessed or observed issues that you'd like to research and write up about, all of that is very welcome um, and we can support you. And we'll be talking about a few ways we can do that at the end of the session as well. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Denise. Um, we, we'll let you go. So and we'll talk to you now in a little while. Um, at this stage, if everyone's okay, oh sorry, Rosemary, would you like to jump in there? Hi, Jane. Yeah, no, I was just thinking there when Denise was talking, and I just maybe just throw it out there for people. And I suppose that is the thing is if you have something that you have already written, you know, whether it is a master thesis or you know, you've been saying some people maybe have written reports or you know, other types of publications that might be for work. So, you know, that's something as well, maybe to think about if you have something. That you, you know you've written it for a different audience but you could repurpose it then and obviously you know a workshop like today that's going to actually explain to you what it is we're looking for in terms of the actual journal you know but it, i think that idea of you know starting with a blank page is always the hardest part so if you actually have something that's tangible you know even if it's only a five page document or something that you think okay that's the bones of what i want to say that i could turn that into a journal article you know i think that's a, that's, that's a really good idea to to think like that so I just wanted to throw that out for people <laughs> thanks thanks very much rosemary that makes an awful lot of sense um yeah the fear of the blank page can be difficult to get started but the, there there's so much that people have already worked on and they have ready that could be converted it's a great idea right. thank you very much um we're going to move if people are okay with this into the presentation part and this powerpoint um 
even though it's it's a reasonable length. It's really to serve as notes as well for yourselves um, if you'd like to get a copy of it later on around really what the ethos of the journal is, what we're looking for from submissions and in brief um, what we've had in the past. So hopefully it will be of some help to you. Please feel free to put questions in the chat or stop me at any stage and um, to ask a question. And then after the presentation, we'll move into our discussion groups and we'll be able to talk freely and, and talk about your particular ideas um, and your thoughts around submission. So if everyone's ready, uh, I'm gonna share the screen now and move into just this small presentation piece. Okay. So, Sorry, it's something weird happening. Anyway, not to worry. There we go. Okay, so for the purposes of just this small section, I've just divided this presentation into the journal piece around what the journal is, our ethos, and what we're looking for. Uh, small input on past successful submissions that we've had, and then we'll be looking at the process of submission after the discussion groups. We'll do a little bit on it now in the minute. So just to get started. I think that many of you are probably very aware of or familiar with the Adult Learner Journal, um, which is the Irish Journal of Adult and Community Education. But if not, just a very brief introduction to it is that the journal has actually been around since the mid 80s and really came out of the Adult um, Education Organisers Association. So we still have those strong links there from people who really had the genesis of the journal um, still today on the editorial board. And that's very important. Um, you can see a copy there that was uh, provided by one of our, our members of the adult learner back from the 80s. And then um, even the passion and commitment was there to share experience from practice uh, and knowledge as well from, from theory and how it's applied through this particular journal. They had a member of the association create the cover and really worked well in a, in a true kind of community way to present this knowledge and share it with others. So from a review in the 70s through uh, the peer review journal, it states here that the Adult Learner Journal um, was founded in the mid 80s and it documents the growth and development of adult learning policy and practice. And it provides a forum for critical reflection on the practices of teaching and learning. And it gives priority to subject matter that really reflects the values and ethos of the journal and the values and ethos of people working in adult and community education around addressing inequality, uh, disadvantage, social exclusion, or, and looking at workplace learning and that teacher-student relationship. So really all of those um, parts of people working with other people um, and learning with other people, helping others to reach their potential um, and to develop their own lives as they move through their lifespan in society. And that was very much part of the ethos ethos and uh, values of the Adult Learner Journal and still is today. So we have had reviews of the journal and, and obviously Aintus has been going for 50 years. So that's a bit of a shock for some of us here. That's a, that we've known it that long. And um, so from millennium to millennium, really from uh, century to century. So Rob Marks, one of the, the key editors from 2010 to 2017 of the journal talks about really how important this journal is as an open access journal that's freely accessible to anyone from all over the world. And that that's a strength in that we can share our knowledge and experience, either theory based or practice or, or a mixture of both. Mm -hmm with all of our colleagues and friends and uh, others working in adult and community education with people internationally and nationally. So the idea is to assist educators and other people working in the area of lifelong learning to help develop their knowledge and um, their experience, their understanding of what they're doing and why they're doing it um, and the impact of what they're doing with the people they're working with and also very much so uh, always has been the case, but has become something of a mantra in recent years, really to look at the learner voice and to listen to learners, to listen to people that we are working with um, and working together to help develop potential and to see if we can capture their learning and what they want from the world and that we can reflect and refract that through our experience and our writing in the Adult Learner Journal. journal. So we're trying to become experts in the promotion of lifelong learning as a valued field of practice in the civic, social and economic development of nations across the world. And it sounds like a lofty ambition, but it's something that we're doing 
every day of the week um, and that you're doing every day of the week. And it's something we want to do better and better as we move on. Okay, so this is just something from an editorial back in 2002, which is hard to believe uh, 20 years ago, but it was rep reprinting a quote from Ted Fleming and, and many of us would know Ted Fleming and his work. Um, from 1985 about the development of the journal and what was happening in adult and community education at the time. So what he was saying was that developments are taking too fast, are taking place too fast in adult education to allow time for reflection and debate. And that may be something that resonates with us today as our world is getting busier and busier and time is getting tighter and tighter and, and time as a resource becomes less flexible um, and less easy to access in terms of our relationships, discussions and work with others. And this is what was happening in 85. And here we are many decades later, kind of experiencing that squeeze even more so. And it's something that perhaps we need to push back on um, and to look at and to explore and talk about. So he was pushing to say that we need to cast a critical analytical eye. And, and that's really what journals uh, and journal articles are about. It's that analysis of what we are doing, taking the time to step back and reflect, and then to present that for others to understand about the work we're doing, the people we're with, and um, how we feel about that, our effective learning, and um, how they feel, and how that practice is actually benefiting people's lives, and how we can do more. And also uh, areas that are challenges for us, um, and ideas around why things aren't improving or changing perhaps as quickly as they should, and how we can address that. So he talks about this critical analytical eye on the concept practice, and maybe the taken for granted assumptions of advocates of community education. And that, again, is is really key to research and key to journal articles and journals such as the adult learner. What are our assumptions in this space and can we challenge them and turn a lens on ourselves around this? Um, and we've seen journal articles over the years doing that, uh, challenging our own assumptions around our practice, what we're doing and whether we're doing it as well as we could. Um, and have we become maybe stale or maybe a bit set in our ways, or perhaps we've become a bit cynical in terms of the area that we're working in and perhaps the drivers that are impacting upon us in that area. So can we challenge those assumptions as well, kind of individually, in our communities, nationally, internationally, and write about that and from a place of authenticity and share that with others, which is what we're doing on a daily basis. So in terms of past themes and topics of the Adult Learner Journal, which comes out once a year, um, the emphasis in most articles, and this won't be a surprise to you, has been on empowering learning through diverse communities and diverse learners. So really reflecting our society, our country, and the people that are living in it, including ourselves. Um, and the themes that emerged are community development, second chance education, literacy, basic education, language needs, uh, very prevalent at the moment in the need, policy and politics that impact upon us, um, women and women in education, and reflection as a key part of understanding that and presenting that. And also the journal can record what's happening, right? so it can capture a moment in time uh, and express a view on that. And that's an important repository of social history and uh, social understanding of what's happening from politics, from ideologies, from sociological thought, um, and the impact of existential threats, as we know about them, and less existential threats on the world today. So the main equity focus from this study that was done three years ago was on community, on second chance, on low literacy, on the experience of the unemployed and on migrants or refugees, um, and also the learner experience, um, our own populations and minority populations in Ireland and groups, um, members of the traveling community, men, older or retired people, young people and their experiences, and rural or isolated people as well. But what uh, Golding and Harvey pointed out here is that the language, Irish, as a language and also our identity there. Uh, disabilities, 
which often can be very invisible. Um, we, we talk about invisible pedagogy, about supporting and accommodating people with disabilities or, or learning difficulties or other issues. But if the people aren't in the classroom or the learning environment, that practice um, may not be happening. So that point around people with disabilities being visible and being in education and training with us adult learning we're still pushing to increase participation rates in adult learning to meet our standards from other european countries and um, why is not that happening how do we help people to engage with learning and what are the supports there and, that, and some of that is social policy it's governmental policy some of it is education policy and uh, or some of it is approaches outreach and how we uh, engage with people who are the, the hard to reach or who aren't engaging with the services that we know. Well-being is again a key theme, has been around for a while now and means different things to different people <laughs> and, and different reception for that. But essentially in this case, it means the, really the, the person's life, the quality of their life um, and their levels of happiness uh, of economic well-being of um, social capital cultural capital how they engage with others and all of those complexity of areas that surround humans as we engage with each other so other themes that have happened in the last five years you may or may not be aware of include taking the temperature of adult learning seeing what's happening out there in 2018 looking at what's been achieved by ANTHUS in the last 50 years and I suppose testing our own assumptions and ANTHUS around the work that we're doing and also reflecting the, the real kind of valued and much loved place of Paolo Ferreira in community education and the idea of critical pedagogy and how that's working. Obviously after 2020 the pandemic hit so we were seeing how that impacted and then in 22 measuring the success and all the good stories and all the positive stories coming out of adult and community education after a very challenging couple of years. And this year we're kind of handing it over to you to make decisions around what you'd like to share and, and from your answer to the question there earlier it looks like a really wide varied and interesting diverse range of topics that are absolutely critical and crucial to explore and present and share with the world so thank you for that so this is the adult learner call now i hope i'm not speaking too quickly for everybody i am running through this at a rate of knots but yeah i think we're okay for time so this is the adult learner call at the moment there's still plenty of time uh, to get a submission in and we're talking about different things not a prescriptive list uh, universal design for learning which has become very much part of a, a core strategy from ahead always was from the working cast in the us but also part of uh, fet hope and a strategy from solace around embedding universal design for learning um into our work and what we're doing sustainability very much part of what we need to look at at the moment sustainability in education education for sustainability um, and then climate change as well related to that but not the whole story in terms of sustainability um, refugees and adult education online how that's worked how that's still working and um, increasing accessibility that outreach idea and opening up more avenues for people to engage with adult and community education and using that learning from our practice for social change um, and seeing how we can represent that and put that through. Also migrant experiences, so as people coming in, uh, into our country and into our communities talking to them, listening to them, giving them an opportunity to also represent who they are and their stories and use their own voice to do that within the journal very much welcomed and also advocates for migrants and others that may want some support in presenting that story. Okay, so important message. What is your message, right? What do you want to say? And Denise has talked about what she did in terms of developing work from her master's thesis. Rosemary was, was responding to ideas there around converting something you already have done or a, a genesis of an idea that you've tried to capture, perhaps just in notes to yourself, a diary, a blog post, um, something that you want to say. So have you implemented something that has worked well? So in your role, in your community, in your job, in your practice, do you want to raise awareness about something? 
is there something that you really feel is not being looked at and you can do some some research some literature searching yourself around what it is and present that for another audience to understand it have you critically reflected on something and come to a an understanding or a decision around that that you'd like to share, perhaps to provoke thought, stimulation, perhaps to challenge policy, um, are the assumptions of others around a particular space. Have you done something differently that challenges the usual thinking? And we know that that idea of challenge is difficult in our society today. Um, there's very binary and confrontational points of view around people's um, ideas and thoughts at times and it tends to fall on the left or the right um, and that discussion that debate is crucial um, and we have to obviously respect others and respect everyone's point of view we need to follow the law and in as much as possible our, our, our moral thoughts and feelings and human rights agenda but there may be something here that we're missing and it would be lovely to hear from others that have a different point of view about a particular maybe established and accepted viewpoint and that they can evidence that and express that in a way that gets others thinking about it. And you may also want to comment on a policy direction. And it would be wonderful if you could use your experience as evidence of that comment and um, to underpin your thinking and your thoughts mm. and explain the direction of it. Oh, well, there's a rookie mistake. My phone down there. Sorry about that. Okay. Thank you. Right. So in terms of the types of articles that we're looking for, there's two types. There's a theory or a critical debate paper or a practice based paper. And sometimes you'll have both of those in one. And that's fine because as an editorial board in the peer review process, we'll look through that and we'll come back to you in terms of what we're looking for or how to maybe shape it towards one or the other. So the theory papers are longer. They're 8,000 words. And um, as Denise says about stating the obvious, you need that word count at times to explain the methodology to explain the theories that you're looking at and also to remove bias in your writing so that people understand where you're coming from and know who you are and what you're presenting so those papers engage in critical debate and analysis of concepts policies and theories and practice so they would have some indication of the research methodology that's used or the approach that's there. Um, and it's often there to initiate dialogue around a particular subject or a program or a practice or an area that needs debate. The practice-based papers are less long, they're 3,000 words, and we wouldn't be expecting um, so much rigor around the detail of the research approach or the methodology, but still they would need to be underpinned by evidence in some way from the literature in part, and also perhaps from evidence that you've gathered from uh, first person testimony or uh, verbatim kind of quotes from any type of evaluation or Q&A or focus group that you've carried out with participants. So it's good to have that evidence within the practice based paper and that link to literature, but it's not as um, as much as you would need for a theory paper. All right, so that's something we can guide you on as well after submission. In terms of writing the paper article, these are just some ideas around a kind of sequence of addressing it, of, of getting going, and the things that we're looking for. So the article should align with the journal focus. So it's you can get that from reading previous articles from the last couple of years around how the focus broadly aligns with what the journal theme was for that particular year. So this year it's open to you. But if you're writing for universal design for learning, just to, to scope it into that particular mm -hmm. area and present the evidence under that. So you're writing to a very wide audience, not just in adult and community education, um, but people right across Europe and internationally, as well as the national audience for adult and community ed. So in part, you need to explain what you're talking about. So um, try and keep the acronyms to a minimum and perhaps explain what an organization is or where you're coming from or a particular theory so people can understand that um, and that it's very clear and no ambiguity. But also it gives you an opportunity to explain that particular niche area or niche idea um, very clearly and take your time to present the evidence and the ideas around it to this wider audience. 
alter philosophy and bias we're going to come to in a minute. Um, and the key thing that Denise mentioned there is structure. So structuring your article in a logical, sequential kind of systematic way helps all of us to understand that narrative and that story that you're telling. And that's the reason really that undergraduate th uh, theses, masters, PhDs, articles and journals all have a similar structure and it's kind of a shorthand to validity and reliability, this idea that everyone has followed a, a particular process to present this evidence and this idea in a very clear way that we can all understand and that it is transparent uh, for everyone to work through. Discuss the limitations and the significance of your work. So where you maybe met obstacles, put that in. Um, where you met challenges, please write to that. Um, and where you had very positive successes, uh, successes, please write to that as well. So we'd love to see that whole journey of that article, that story that you're telling in the article. Try and write consistently. So that's really the key thing, that the tone is consistent, that the terminology you use is clear and explained and also consistent. And that that writing, um, even though we want to see you in it, that that kind of writing is more around that objective passive style in part in the theory papers maybe. Um, but also if you're writing a reflective type article, that you're using that I and that we consistently as well. And we know where you're coming from in that reflective piece, that it's very much from your point of view. Now we'll come to the style guide in a minute. And that is a very important part of any journal article and any publishing in a journal is adhering to a style guide. And, and journals are very particular about that in terms of that consistency of presentation um, and also that rigor around how it's presented to the audience that's going to read it. And again, the evidence piece is there. So just moving quickly on, this is the Adult Learner Journal from 2022. And we had about seven um, articles in there, a mixture of theory and practice within it. And you can see the variety there from uh, communities of practice in adult education, family support, human rights and inclusion, um, teaching in an emergency remote teaching context, and right through um, to a very interesting reflective dialogue between Camilla Fitzsimons and Lillian Nuanzi about anti-racist learning environments where they're really checking their own assumptions, exploring their own ideas and thoughts and asking questions within that. So that, that might be interesting for some of you to explore as a different type of presentation. The theory one I've picked out is psychological capital, the missing link. And it's just showing that even though it's a theory article, it's very accessible in its writing. It's written clearly and plainly, and all acronyms or concepts are explained as you read through it. And there's a structure there of the introduction, the context, some literature around what psychological capital is, the findings that they've taken from their doctoral work, and then recommendations which really come from their informed view from evidence of what psychological capital should be used for in adult and community education. And then there's a conclusion, a summary of what has been written there and the limitations from the author's viewpoint. So they didn't use subheadings, they used paragraph breaks instead, and they used very simple language. And we, they talked about themselves and their viewpoint within it, um, which was very clear and very, it was um, kind of linking in with our own values and ethos of people, not just talking about the research in the third sense or the third person, but people having a viewpoint and a, an impassioned kind of plea for change. There's a thread all the way from start to finish, and that's key that the abstract what you're saying and the introduction right through to the conclusion has a clear through line to it for the reader. So the reader understands what the article is about, what you did, how you did it, and what you found out, and the meaning of all of that. The practice one I've picked out here is from Ankasan. Sorry, I'll just move that forward again. And this is by Thomas Murray there. And it's about a project uh, called the Right to Work Education Project that was delivered with 40 international protection applicants who are living in direct provision. And this is a practice based article. And much of it is really verbatims and understanding of the verbatim, as in the actual words that participants uh, gave into the evaluation and discussions about the programme and the value of it to them. 
So very much so the author has allowed the participants to speak for themselves, facilitated them to do that. And it's explained very simply through four headings of the introduction around the organization, the project and the participants, how the program was run, the celebration of the success of that, and then a small amount on the human rights from below. So the conclusion piece is really around what does this mean for human rights education and for supporting people in these areas. And they used head posts, uh, headings to signpost the content as you move through it because it was a broader written piece and um, which really helped and there was less references to literature but there was many inclusions and references to policy and reports where appropriate wonderful quotes and some numerical data as well so you can put the figures into the articles too so a, a bar chart or a pie chart or a table and the style guide to follow that and it was mainly written in the passive voice so it wasn't i or we but the warmth of the project and the commitment and passion of the authors really came through so i'm just coming to the end here, but uh, just a few more minutes that a, a suggested structure you could use would be the title, the abstract the keywords this is what we need to help people search the articles and then an introduction, some literature, how you did it, the methodology and then the findings and discussion of what was discovered, what was researched, what does it mean for you, and then a conclusion and a reference list. Now. Meaning, make, meaning making in terms of theory and practice articles within the journal really relate to who you are. And we use paradigms and philosophy uh, by we, uh, people in academia and others writing research articles, really as a shorthand to explain who we are and what we think. So even though they're based in a philosophical context and, and sometimes a sociological context, it's about the reality of the world we live in and who you are living in that world and what you believe and think about reality around you. And it helps others when they're looking at an article to understand that. Now, for all of us writing in the journal, we don't have to go into a big philosophical uh, statement or write paragraphs about that, but it's just interesting in terms of where we're coming from. So many of us in adult and community education are very much in uh, the qualitative kind of field, so the post-positivist field, where we care about people and people are who we work with and who we research with, um, and many times in a co-participative way. So we're doing it together rather than having research done on to somebody else. And, and that's very much um, the commitment that right. people working in adult and community education have. So it can be a qualitative piece um, and it can sometimes be stated as it's interpretivist or constructivist. And really what that means is that you, you are listening to people's lived experience. So you can, you've heard of um, possibly uh, Jack Whitehead um, and Mesro as well. So this whole idea of theory around transformative learning, the lived experience um, and how people live and work together and understanding how they interpret the world around them and reflecting that in our research is very much part of researchers in education and training tends to be in the social sciences. And again, I've stuck a little picture in there of Paolo around critical pedagogy and staying true to roots of empowerment um, and equity and respect for everybody within our society. So it's just about who you are and removing the bias from an article by stating your views and maybe some of these areas that you relate to are used in your work so that people can understand where you're coming from. All right. Lastly, academic rigor in qualitative research because often we don't have the st statistical analysis um, to fall back on as a measure of validity, a measure of something being reliable and true and checkable and repeatable in later life. We talk about trustworthiness and Guba and Lincoln also talk about a consensus of truth. So what we're trying to find from the research that we do is a consensus from everyone um, around what truth means and what's important and of value and what can improve people's lives. So we talk about credibility and ethics within that. So an ethical process was followed. We talk about transferability, which means really in your articles, describing what's happening and describing what people say so that others readers can judge for themselves and dependability is stating that are, are obvious in every step of your writing so that uh, others who aren't familiar with the field 
can understand what you're saying. And then confirmability means that we can follow that thread, that true line in your article and see that objectivity or that bias written into it so we know where you're coming from. Inclusive language is something that's coming through a lot um, for researchers and for people writing in journals. And really it's about not doing harm or trying not to cause unnecessary offence to groups that maybe get offended quite a lot through uh, so social policy or cultural norms. So I leave that there for you to read again, but it's just something we'd ask you to do. And this is the Aintus style guide which is made available to you and also some excellent infographics that our colleagues in Aintus have done up and are available on the Aintus website. And really it's a very, very detailed step-by-step -step guide for you to use as a checklist when you get to the end of your article. And you can go back to that and look at it in terms of the paragraph spacing, the font size, the alignment, abbreviations, how to present things. There are no headers and footers, there's no end notes within the journal articles in Aintus. So again, we're keeping to that consistent style. And there's an example there of the abstract. And you may think this is pedantic, but it is standard in that the abstract is indented 1.27 centimeters from the left, is 14 point times New Roman bolded, and that the abstract is 100 words in 12 point times New Roman in italics. So that's the detail that we go on in terms of that final piece in writing up. But that is the least of your worries today, right? That is going to be at the end of the article and we will be helping you and supporting you in that process. These are some of the timelines uh, and infographics that are available to you there um, up on the Aintus website, but we'll come back to that maybe in the wrap up and we can also refer to it in terms of our discussions in the discussion group. So for the moment, I'm going to stop sharing um, and I'm going to see how everybody is. Is everyone still with me? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Rosemary. <laughs> trying to get their mics off mute, probably. <laughs> um, that was a whistle stop tour. Uh, guys, but we will share the slides with you. And obviously the adult learner style guide is up on the Aintus website. We'll come back to that after the discussion rooms, but we can also talk about these things there. So what we might do now is move into our discussion rooms. Um, I'll just share that slide again, Juliana, about how they are, are going to work. So here we are. So we have three discussion rooms based on you, our first time writer, experienced academic writer, or exper experienced academic writer with a previous publication record. So I will hand over to my colleagues here to see how we will work through that. OK, so if you want to pick group one, new or first time writer, group two, experienced academic writer, or group three, experienced academic writer with a previous publication record, um, we can then jump into the groups with Rosemary and David and Denise and other members of Aintus to support you there. I'm going to go through the process as the wrap up at the very last bit there because there was some questions about the process of submission a second ago. But um, just to say in our group and, and uh, even uh, Denise were there and we had a very interesting discussion. Uh, those uh, four other potential authors um, Mary Carmen and Antigone and Liz and Grania. Um, unfortunately, Liz got nabbed by Amazon at the door, so <laughs> we, we didn't get to talk. But very interesting themes um, around transformative learning, uh, uh, the experience of uh, adverse childhood experiences on youth reach learners and participants and that impact on people and their learning as they move through the system and the need for teachers to uh, be educated around that and to understand the diversity and the experiences of learners and also um, around neurodiversity in the PLC sector. So there were very common themes and threads that uh, the author were drawing out uh, already between each other there. So that was a really interesting group. So uh, would anyone else like to just talk to their experience in the discussion group? I'd, I'd just make a quick point from, from us with, with, um, with Giselle and Alice um, about publishing from 
studies that you've done, i.e. PhDs or, or, or MA courses where you've done and you've, you've written um, uh, a dissertation that, that you, can, you can extract various articles from. Um, and I think the other point that we made or that we discussed was the the it you you can enter the process without without annoying us by not completing the process. So if you enter the process and and put a proposal forward, and you're not ready to actually write it, well, you'll get feedback on it, and you'll be you know you 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 have access to us to give you ideas of how you might develop it, and then when you're ready to come back, you just take up the process again. There are quite a lot of journals in, in, in the academic world that, well, most journals in the academic world, it's quite the opposite. Mm. You know, you send your article off into a big black hole and you find out six months later that they've rejected it because of some minor silly thing that you, anyway, I won't, you know, we, we could all complain a lot about academic journals, but that, does, that doesn't happen with Aintus. And that's been one of the most pleasant parts of my experience of being on the editorial board Aintus is it, it's a personal process and, and you know we work with authors to make sure that they produce the best article they can so that our journal is is as as, as valuable as it can be for the, for people in the sector so do put your toe in the water as you've done today by coming along to to this session but don't feel that you're you know that by submitting an article you're saying anything other than look I've got think I might have something interesting to say and I'd like help in in saying it Absolutely, David, I completely agree. Um, and that's very much the view of the board and of um, the people within Aintus and has been that we were very interested in the experience and ideas and suggestions that have come through today and come through across the board. So we're very happy um, for people to submit that in the process. I'm just going to go through that now briefly before we wrap up. Um, and we can support people into the future as well. If 2023 isn't, isn't the right time for you, that's something we can support you in developing um, and bringing that article to fruition. And we'd be very happy to do that because we also learn a huge amount in that process. So thank you very much, guys. We really appreciate your time and your and inputs into the discussion rooms there. Um, that's great. We're gonna just go into the deadlines now, actually, if that's all right. Um, Gary, so I'll just share the screen. Is everyone okay with that for the moment? And if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat there and we'll come back to them in, in two seconds. Okay. All right. So that's my chat getting in the way there. I've just removed that. Okay. Creepers, creepers. I'm in terrible trouble with the technology today. Right. So how we submit an article. Okay, so you email the journal at aintus.com with your proposed article title, and this can be a work in progress. Don't worry if that changes again. And um, I think the the usual state is flux when you're writing. <laughs> so things go back and forth. So it's the proposed article title, um, the proposed article type, whether it's a theory or a practice article at, at this stage, and a short profile of yourself. So who you are, where you're coming from. And then we also need an article abstract. So that abstract is kind of different to the one that you're going to use in the finished article. It's between 400 and 500 words. And it's really for us to understand what you're thinking of for that article. OK, so it's not the same as the finished abstract next year. And this um, article abstract should include the introductory overview. So just um, maybe 200, 100 words around that. The methodology you're going to use if you're doing a case study or if you're uh, representing something from a master's, the methodology that was used there, or the approach that you're using, maybe discussing through a concept, uh, illustrating or presenting a viewpoint around teacher education, around uh, ACES, around something like that, and, and how this article relates to adult and community education. So this is you telling us what you think the article is going to look like and what it's going to be about. OK, so it's very much for the submission piece. And the deadline for that is five o'clock on Friday, the 27th of January. Is that OK for everyone? 
Okay, so in the review process, and there are infographics uh, in this presentation and also up on the AINTIS website giving you the detail of this, we receive the submissions by email and they're brought to the editorial board and all members of the editorial board review and look through the submissions. Um, and then we would either come back to you or, or support you in terms of that uh, progression of that article. And then we will look for the submitted papers in uh, will be reviewed in February 2023 and authors will be advised of the submission acceptance in March 2023. So there is a process of us coming back and forth to you from that uh, initial submission to the finished article being required and the reviewing of them in February. Mary Carmen, do you want to jump in there? And, uh, and also other uh, Aintus people, if you want to jump in as well. Go ahead. Just before I go to class, I just wanted to clarify. So at the very start, for that first deadline in January is only to submit the abstract, not the article. No, it's the abstract. That's my um, understanding. understanding. Okay. Ain't us people, do you want to jump in in case I have that? And then I, okay. I, can, I can clarify that. It's the full Thank article you. that will be submitted ah. on the 27th. There you go. Oh, so it's diff it, that's what I wasn't. I wasn't very clear. I understood that it was just the abstract, but now it's so it's the five hundred abstract and the full article. Correct. With our own. Okay, perfect. That's great. Thank you so much. I'm no sorry problem. Need to to leave for class. Thank you. Thanks, Barry Carmen. Lovely meeting you all. We'll be in touch. Thank you. In terms of additional supports, um, you can call an AINTIS staff member or email the journal at AINTIS.com at any stage and we'll come back to you on that. And we're also going to be running a second workshop, which is around finalising the articles, and that will be on the 11th of January 2023. And there's a link in the call to that and also information on the website where you can register if you want to come back to us um, at that finalising stage to have a chat and a discussion about that. Also, AINTIS have produced an editorial office. So there will be a number of people in that editorial office with experience of publishing and uh, writing who can provide feedback on the technical aspects of journal articles if you need that support and help. Um, and we'd like to offer that to you in terms of the style guidelines and what you're doing. And also it helps us as well in terms of the finalization of articles for publication. And the last thing is we were hoping to develop potentially a peer learning network. And I think the people in our discussion group would be very interested in that because of the obvious connections and themes and the shared ethos and experience of working in this area. So with your permission, um, if you, I think you were asked that also in the invitation to the workshop, we would share your details with others at the workshop so we can develop a peer network around this. Um, and I'm also available to you and others for discussion about your articles as you're working through the development of them. All right, well, then it's just up to me to say thank you. Um, Thank you for the really interesting and valuable discussion, the discussion rooms, and for taking time out of your, your busy Wednesday to be with us and for your interest um, and your commitment and passion for adult and community education and the Adult Learner Journal and, and what we're trying to achieve with it. Um, and we very much look forward to walk, working with you and talking with you in the future. So thank you, everybody. And thanks to Ainthus, um, our editorial board, David and Rosemary and Denise for coming on board as well. And it was lovely to meet you all. Thanks everybody for this morning.